Okay, this is about uh, Lerner and Lowe, uh, sort of a, I hate to put it this way, sort of a poor man's Rodgers and Hammerstein, um, because they had a very parallel style of working, and for my money, they put out some beautiful work, including one piece that's just classic, um, but maybe didn't quite achieve the level of, of drama and a level of fun. We'll get to that, that R&H did. Um, but uh, Frederick, or Fritz Lowe, certainly lived an interesting life. Um, Frederick Lowe, who was the composer in this team, as opposed to Alan J. Lerner, who was the lyricist, uh, Fritz Lowe, as his friends called him, was the son of a tenor in the Viennese operettas um, of the day, and uh, came as a pro child prodigy. He was playing the piano at five, he was writing music at seven, he was contributing scenes for his father's uh, skits at, at a local club at nine, and at 13 became the youngest pianist and who appears as solos with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. Um, his talent and his training were kind of part of his life, but, but interestingly, he was most interested in, in, in kind of striking out on his own. He came to the United States in 1924 to begin an American career in music, and he found that he couldn't really make any headway there, or get at least any, any, any jobs, so he decided to quit music for good. And for several years, he knocked around the country, and he held down some very interesting jobs. He punched cattle, he was a miner for gold, he engaged as a professional boxer and was a sparring partner to other professional boxers and trainer. Uh, he was a horseback riding instructor and he worked sort of as a cowboy on a major range in the West. Um, all of this is particularly interesting because if you could picture this tall, muscular, granite, square-jawed, blue-eyed, uh, you know, grizzly, almost Clint Eastwood looking fellow, but with a very high voice because he was a tenor, and a strong German accent, so I wonder if he opened his mouth and spoke, if it kind of belied the general vision of what he was like. Um, a turning point in his career came a few years later through a chance meeting uh, at a place called the Lambs Club with a young librettist and lyricist named Alan J. Lerner. Now, Lerner was born to wealth uh, in New York. He, his parents uh, owned the prestigious Lerner shops, some of which are still department stores uh, today. He uh, also went to Harvard College. Today, I guess, is our Harvard Crimson Day for, uh, for covering folks. And uh, while attending Harvard, uh, wrote sketches and did work for the Harvard Hasty Pudding Theatricals, which is a group that still performs comic sketches and skits today. Um, he was a member also of this group called the Lambs Club. Now, the Lambs Club in New York was a gentleman's club, and in the sense that this is the kind of club where people would sit in high back leather chairs and smoke pipes and you know, tell interesting tales to each other about hunting and such. And they had a policy, which may sound either interesting or condescending, depending on your point of view, where members of the club could find other people that the club members would find interesting and invite them on like guest day, simply because they had an interesting biography or they'd be somebody you'd like to meet. And Fritz Lowe, being a, you know, Austrian emigrant, child prodigy, tenor, boxer, cattle punch, miner, <clears throat> was an interesting person. So they brought him along and what he wound up spending almost the entire time talking to look to learner and the two of them hit it off almost immediately and decided they both agreed about what what the best way to approach doing a show and what was good and bad about music um, attempts to invade the broadway stage for them proved a little bit disheartening um, even as a team they worked on a number of shows that, that just fell apart um, for example a show called what's up which ran for just uh seven weeks um, and before that, a show called The Day Before Spring, which ran even shorter than that. Lord and Lowe figured out that perhaps they could open a show outside of New York, which now is something that everybody does. Um, you find a city which still has a big cultural, like Boston or, or many other cities, that has a big cultural scene, and you put on your show and with a little bit less financial risk. This way, when audiences come and see it, if it's good, you can go back to New York folks and say, look, this was already sold out to people and in Cleveland or Detroit or wherever it was, and people loved it, and now we've tested it out with audiences, you should give it a try in New York. And they did that particularly with a show they wrote in 1947 called Brigadoon. Uh, I to, these are some major Lerner and Lowe projects. Um, Brigadoon in 1947, uh, Paint Your Wagon in 51, My Fair Lady in 56, a motion picture which becomes significant called Gigi in 1958, and a piece called Camelot in 1960. But with Brigadoon, um, Lerner and Lowe seem to have learned a lot from the way that 
Rodgers and Hammerstein have constructed a musical in the sense that this musical also features an ingenue couple and a soubrette couple. It also features um, a, a two-act, uh, you know, it even uh, a two-act format. It also features the ballet sequence. It's got a lot like a Rodgers and Hammerstein piece. Brigadoon is primarily a play about a mythical village in Scotland, which is under a magical curse where it can only exist for one day every hundred years. So people don't age a whole heck of a lot. And after that day, it just disappears. And there are rules where if a person stays there, they have to either disappear with the village or the village has to stay and age in real time if, if there's a person from the outside world. And of course, two young men on a hunting trip stumble into Brigadoon and fall in love with two young ladies who are in Brigadoon, and one of them uh, decides to stay. The film version of this does a nice job of sort of this hand reaching out of the mist and that person's hand taking it, pulling him in, and they just disappear like that. Uh, the music to it is actually quite lovely, and this is probably my opportunity to talk to you about what I may have said earlier. Lerner and Lowe is sort of Rodgers and Hammerstein, but very, very carefully laid out, perhaps too carefully. There's not a lot in Lerner and Lowe which is knee-slappingly funny. That said, there's a lot that makes you think. There's a lot of music that's very pretty. It often doesn't depart in crazy ways like, say, Sondheim does. It kind of has its own measured style. And at the end of the day, it's much more concerned with getting a story across than it is with surprising the audience in some ways. And some folks have, have not necessarily warmed to their work and, and as much because of their sort of carefulness with the text. Well, that's probably not the case, however, with My Fair Lady from 1956. Now, in order to talk to you about My Fair Lady, I have to talk to you about one of the great figures in the American, I'm sorry, in the world, in this case, theater, a man named George Bernard Shaw. Make no mistake, Shaw was not an American. Um, Shaw was, by birth, an Irishman, and uh, lived in a very interesting span of time from about, I believe, I want to say 1849 to 1950, although I'm maybe a little off there. Um, but lived in such a way that he lived through the first half of the 20th century and lived into and, and, and was a big part of the Victorian era as well. Um, with, with Shaw, he had started out as a critic, as, as a theater critic, and wrote primarily uh, reviews. And later in his life, decided, well, I can do that. I could write plays. With Shaw's plays, which are primarily plays about major social issues, Shaw himself was a socialist and, and had an awful lot, of, uh, awful lot to say about women's suffrage, an awful lot to say about um, uh, financial inequality, and particularly about class and classism and the warfare between the upper and the lower classes. He was fascinated with these kind of things. And he also, I guess, probably didn't trust actors as a playwright as much as, say, Shakespeare or some of the other greats. When Shakespeare wrote a play, and some might say that this is because he was also a director and an actor, and he was just busy, and maybe he didn't think of his plays as literature. Shakespearean stage directions, they fight. That's it. They kiss. We don't know if they fight is legions of people and people swinging from the chandeliers in a giant epic battle, or if it's just a little tiny scuffle between two people. Because Shakespeare kind of leaves that to the director. And as a result, you get a wide variety of interpretations of Shakespearean work. With Shaw, his stage directions are sometimes so long that they take up two pages before we even get to a piece of dialogue. And they talk about which arm a person raises first and how they toss their head and how many times they breathe and, and, and count before they speak their next line. Shaw, for a director, is like having somebody in the back seat of your car going, oh, no, you're going to miss the turn, no, you know, and, and kind of constantly backseat driving you. Some directors just take the Shaw scripts and put a marker right through all the directions and just do what they want. But Shaw has also written plays that make it very difficult. So Shaw was very exacting and not terribly trusting of directors or of people other than, frankly, of people who were not named George Bernard Shaw. He wrote a major play, which was a very successful piece called Pygmalion. And 
that's uh, P Y G M A L I O N, right? Um, you may have heard the tale of, of, of an artist who falls in love with his own work, with a statue or something, or his own reflection, and becomes so, so invested in that. In the case of Pygmalion, it's the story of uh, Professor Henry Higgins who is a very arrogant, very upper-class British teacher of speech. He's able to tell what part of the country people come from, but listening to them, he's very overconfident himself. And he has this notion that he can make anyone into a proper gentleman or lady, particularly lady. He basically says it's really about the clothes, it's about what they say, and it's about how they talk. And in the ultimate condescending fashion, he sees a flower girl named Eliza Doolittle who has very little and is very poor and is kind of uncultured. And he basically says to a friend of his, look, even that piece of trash over there, if you gave me a certain amount of time with her and you, we dressed her up, I could pass her off as a college-educated society woman that everyone loves and a part of upper, the upper class. All it takes is me teaching her how to talk. And as part of that bet, um, they in fact invite this woman uh, to take lessons and uh, she is gradually indeed transformed, at least on the surface, into this very, very classy person. In the end, when she discovers that this is what they've done, she's deeply hurt, and she says that he's the one that's really trashy, because he's taken this person and taken advantage of her, used her, and, and looked down on her so, and that she resents that. And it, it kind of does not resolve itself particularly well, um, but, and, and Mr. Higgins is sort of brought, you know, kind of reeled in and, and kind of brought to task about this. Um, it had been decided that My Fair Lady would make, uh, that, that, that Pygmalion would make a wonderful musical, My Fair Lady being that show. And a number of composers were approached. Richard Miles and Hammerstein, and Cole Porter, and many other people. Now, a lot of the people, the prevailing wisdom was, I don't want to work, do this show because I don't want to work with that guy. I don't want to do a show where George Shaw is just going to take it apart no matter what I do and tell me it's not right. Well, and George Bernard Shaw did the whole world a great favor, uh, at least in terms of the production of My Fair Lady, in that he died. And as a result, with him out of the way, Lerner and Lowell made, sat down with the play and took the job when no one else wanted it and managed to construct one of the great and truly brilliant musicals of, of the 20th century. Um, the amazing thing is it's very hard to see where Shaw stops and Lerner and Lowe begin. The, the, the style is very, very seamlessly put together. Uh, the piece is filled with classic music, some of which I'm going to make available to you as part of the, the links that we'll have with this lecture. And it, it wound up starring two really interesting people, um, an actor named Rex Harrison. You know, Harrison said, he thought that he was doing Pygmalion. He had no idea that he, he had no interest in doing a musical. And refused to learn to sing, refused to sing, didn't want anything to do with singing. And the way they got around that was a sort of a German style. It comes from Germans originally called Sprecht Saga, or speak singing. And you hear it a lot, this idea that if a character sort of essentially recites the lyrics in rhythm, and the band is playing the melody underneath that person talking, it kind of gives the illusion that they're singing. And it works rather well with Harrison. Speaking of the illusions of singing, My Fair Lady was a breakthrough show for a young actress named Julie Andrews. And you know Julie Andrews, and I don't have to tell you much about that. Um, truly one of, the, one of the really brilliant performers to come out of London's West End. And she played Eliza Doolittle on stage for a long time. And when it came time to make My Fair Lady into a film, um, she, you know, was told that she wasn't a big enough star, that she wasn't famous enough, and they wanted to go with someone else. They hired Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn uh, could not sing at all. And so for the sung parts of the My Fair Lady film, they hired another actress named Marnie Nixon. And her job was to sing all the songs, and Audrey Hepburn would lip sync all of the songs in the show. Um, meanwhile, Julie Andrews would find work elsewhere. Uh, she would be hired by the folks over at Walt Disney and would wind up in a film 
I'm sure you know, called Mary Poppins. Interesting side note, the 1964 Academy Awards, um, Julie Andrews won the, act, the Oscar for Best Actress in a Leading Role. And one of the people that she defeated for Best Actress in a Leading Role that year was Audrey Hepburn in the role of Alice Doolittle in My Fair Lady. So I guess that worked out just fine. Um, My Fair Lady is another one of those shows that is frequently uh, done and performed by colleges and groups and universities and, 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 uh, and community theaters. So there's a very good chance you've seen it. And it holds up rather well. It's a lot of fun to perform and it features uh, song after song that the audience just finds extraordinarily familiar again and again. It's also a very involved uh, costume piece. Speaking of very involved costume pieces, this brings me to a film. In 1958, Larry Lower asked to work on a motion picture. It would be an adaptation of a French novel called Gigi. Almost uh, kind of some stories that you know about in the past kind of being worked in reverse as a young girl is sort of groomed to become a courtesan, to become a successful uh, uh, potential mate for this very wealthy French aristocrat. Um, Gigi is a gorgeous film to look at, and it has a lovely score full of pieces that you may remember. I remember it well, for example. You do now remember it well. It was performed by Maurice Chevalier. Much of the candle and beauty and the beast is based upon Chevalier. If you ever see his performances, you will know why. He had passed away before Beauty and the Beast, so they had to cast someone else in the role. Um, Gigi would later become a stage play as well. And it's part of a trend that we now seem to see more and more of it. Back in the day, you didn't see so much, where motion pictures would move over to the stage after being tried out on the screen. It would take a while, though, to come to the stage in 1973. Uh, finally, I, I have to talk to you about Camelot in 1960. Um, this is a kind of a tough story, and I'll tell you why. Um, during My Fair Lady's uh, run on, on Broadway, when it came to the United States on Broadway in 1956, um, the uh, CBS network, who had been financing some of it, also thought that it would be a good idea to put advertisements in the programs promising a new play in 1960 called Camelot. And Lerner and Lowe, I should add, were not particularly good at working uh, under extreme stress. They would sometimes come out of a writing session uh, with a lot of yelling back and forth with each of them and a lot of really intense stuff. They'd come out friends, it would be this massively difficult thing. And none of them were particularly happy that the show was promised to people before it was really written. <coughs> Nonetheless, um, in 19, uh, a little bit after Gigi in 1958, while they were supposedly working on Camelot and moving into 1959, um, a series of tragedies happened. Lowe suffered a, a massive heart attack. Um, Lerner and Lowe and Moss Hart, um, playwright, he also wrote You Can't Take It With You, was supposed to be working on Aunt Camelot. And then Hart also suffered a, a heart attack within a short space of time. And then Lerner, perhaps under the stress of knowing that so many people had been promised Camelot and that they had, he was visiting one guy in the hospital in one part of town and going across town and visiting the other guy in the hospital. He himself had a nervous breakdown and checked himself into a mental institution. And the three of them were hospitalized and it looked very unlikely that this piece would come together. Nonetheless, it did. Everybody got out of their assorted places where they were and composed a piece that was okay. It, it covers the story of King Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot. One of the problems with Camelot is that the legend features the idea that Arthur and Guinevere are king and, and she is his queen, and that Lancelot, his best friend, uh, also falls in love with her. And there's just no way to write an ending to this piece and be true to the legend that satisfies every part of the audience. People either want the king and queen to stay together, but Lancelot was just such a likable character. Um, in addition, though, the piece features a lot of uneven music. It's kind of not the best score. It's kind of fun to do, though. You've got appearances by Merlin and, and various other characters you'd expect in there. Uh, but it failed. Uh, it was not the most successful piece. It ran longer than anyone thought. It ran uh, for about 800 performances. Um, it featured a lot of stars. Richard Burton, again Julie Andrews, uh, Roddy McDowell, a singer named Robert Goulet, who Canada you may have heard of. Um, 
And it turned out to be that after this piece finished its run, uh, Lerner and Lowe sort of all agreed together that they were not going to uh, do any more work together, that maybe it was best that they part ways. Um, they, they, Lowe retired to Palm Springs, where he remained until his death at 83, um, outliving the hardworking, very heavy uh, living Lerner, who had died at the age of just 68. Uh, Lerner has, was always a very intense personality, so perhaps that contributed to that. Uh, like I said, Lerner and Lowe still have major contributions to the American musical, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of important to cover that. And My Fair Lady alone, even if they just put that piece out there, I think it would secure them a spot in this list of people that we talk about. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, next time we'll tackle uh, a few more folks uh, and their stories. But uh, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.